All right. Um, as you said, I'm Amy Prowell, and um, I will be talking about antibodies and infection in the era of the metagenome. But first, I'd also like to say that it is my first trip to China, and I'm enjoying it very much. And I really relish the opportunity to speak in front of such an international audience. So I definitely thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak, and I appreciate this. Um, all right, so I'll jump right in. What I'm going to talk about, or begin to talk about, are pathogens that have gone undetected for a century. Bacteria that exist in and on the human body, but which evade culture. And we're starting to realize that the genomes of many of these bacteria might well have pathogenic activity. A recent initiative, the NIH Human Microbiome Project, seeks to characterize all the genomes in the human body uh, in the body other than the human genome. And researchers running the initiative have found that an estimated 90% of cells in the human body are bacterial, fungal, or otherwise non-human in origin, while a mere 10% of cells in the body of Homo sapiens are actually human. In fact, the human microbiota is so prolific that even as human microbiome researchers and other scientists work as fast as possible to characterize it, to date only a fraction of the microbiota has been named and characterized. It follows that humans are best viewed as superorganisms. Due to their small size, hundreds or even thousands of bacterial cells can fit inside a human cell. And the combined genetic contributions of these microbes inevitably provide myriad gene products not encoded by our own relatively small genomes. So in reality, the organism we call Homo sapiens is controlled by a metagenome, or a tremendous number of different genomes working in parallel. So the number of genes expressed by our microbial inhabitants, numbers in the millions, or maybe even in the billions, while our own genome contains only approximately 30,000 genes. Um, yet it was only a decade ago that most scientists thought that all bacteria important to man had already been identified. Well now, thanks to shotgun and pyro sequencing, um, we're starting to be able to find DNA um, from hundreds and even thousands of bacteria in tissue and blood. Where do they come from? And what is their relevance to causing disease? This new technology has opened up a new era, an era that some call the era of the metagenome. Where scientists previously had to rely on culturing bacteria, we can now use technology and software to detect them. They can now be characterized based on their genetic fingerprints. And by studying the genes in their genomes, we can figure out how they cause disease processes. For example, this slide represents the bacteria recently determined to persist in the saliva by researchers at the Max Planck Institute. They use 16S RNA to identify bacterial populations of healthy subjects living in 12 areas scattered across the globe. They identified 101 bacterial genera in the mouth, 39 of which had previously never been identified in the human oral cavity. And phylogenetic analysis suggests that an additional 64 genera are also present. And this is just a preliminary study. Um, and these results also showed a greater diversity within and between individuals than had ever been realized. Um, and just to make it clear, the greater the font size of the bacterium, the greater its prevalence is detected by the study. But what, what's particularly interesting is that some of these same bacteria can be found elsewhere inside the body. For example, Porphyromonas and Actinomyces, which we know cause tooth decay, have been identified now in atherosclerotic plaque. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about how this microbiota uh, can may cause and chronic disease and even the antibodies that we call autoantibodies. When it comes to the human microbiota, medicine is now comfortable with bacterial populations that exist in the gut and other uh, areas of the body in contact with the external environment, such as the mouth, the skin, uh, and the, uh, you know, the ears, let's say. Um, but um, 
in fact, ah just about a month ago, the onset of type one diabetes was tied to the specific of composition of bacteria in the murine gut which is very interesting yet now we're finding that microbes persist in many other body tissues ah in joints, blood vessels, and in the many tissues that become inflamed in autoimmune disease Recently, 18 different bacterial taxa were determined to persist in the amniotic fluid, which was previously thought to be completely sterile. And over the past century, bacteria have been repeatedly detected in diseases ranging from sarcoidosis to Alzheimer's, and yet causality could not be demonstrated. But the number of studies associating bacterial genomes with autoimmune and inflammatory conditions is increasing at a rapid pace. This chart shows the bacteria detected when scientists at the University of Glasgow sequenced the bacteria in biofilm removed from prosthetic hip joints uh, during revision arthroplasties. And these were joints uh, removed from a compartment, again, body compartment that was supposed to be sterile. But clearly the compartment in which the joints were located was far from sterile. Um, there was a large prevalence of bacteria and uh, Interestingly, you'll find that the prevalence of hydrothermal vent eubacterium, which is a species of bacteria previously thought to persist only in the depths of the ocean, is actually higher than the prevalence of Staphylococcus, which is a common biofilm species. So components of such a metagenomic microbiota can persist in the cytoplasm of the very cells of the immune system that are supposed to kill them in biofilm communities in which they're protected from the immune response by a self-created polymeric matrix. Um, I'm about to show you a slide of bacteria in the blood of a patient with chronic fatigue syndrome taken by Dr. Andy Wright of Manchester in the United Kingdom. It's blood that's been aged for about six hours at the time of the video. And here we go. Um, Notice the cytoplasm of this cell, which is so heavily infected that it's literally exploding from the pressure, um, shifting there in lenses. And then these long biofilm-like tubule, tubules uh, pr protrude from the infected cell, allowing bacteria to spread from one cell to the next. And uh, if you look at other slides, I don't have a time, but well, you can see them there. You can see the long biofilm, -like, well, look at the whole those are just all these biofilm-like strands that the prevalence in the blood is really is huge and that's not that's not healthy blood um, so um, and of course all the bacteria in a, such a biofilm-like environment are continually uh, sharing genes via horizontal gene transfer so although we're finding hundreds of genera the actual species are in fact orders of magnitude greater again due to the diversity caused by such transfer so, how does the microbiota persist? A fully activated immune response should be capable of clearing pathogens from the body. So it's not surprising that many pathogens have evolved mechanisms that allow them to slow the innate immune response in order to enhance their survival. And uh, one of the major ways to do this, uh, one of the best mechanisms to achieve this end, is subversion of one of the body's key nuclear receptors, the VDR. Um, the TACO gene, when expressed, inhibits mycobacterial entry and survival. And MTB downregulates the VDR and subsequently the expression of TACO in order to survive. And another nasty pathogen, HIV, actually completely overtakes the VDR in order to transcribe its own genome. And it does this by using uh, the VDR to recognize the LTR promoter regions of its reverse DNA. So let's take a look at this VDR. The VDR expresses at least 913 genes, many connected to autoimmune diseases and cancers. And it also regulates expression of several key families of antimicrobial peptides, including the beta defensins and catholicidin. And these play a vital role in allowing the body to target intracellular pathogens. And furthermore, it also transcribes toll-like receptor 2, which targets gram-positive bacteria. 
um, we have shown that at least one bacterial metabolite produced by gliding biofilm bacteria also slows activity of the VDR. And that would be um, actually coming up is a molecular emulation of the ligand. It's the sulfonolipid cap9. You can see it right here. It's bound into the VDR binding pocket. Now what it's doing is it's obstructing other ligands that would otherwise, uh, otherwise dock and activate the receptor, and it's preventing them from initiating gene transcription. And you can tell that CAP9 is a very stable ligand here because of the fact that the VDR is constantly moving, and yet it remains steadily in the binding pocket with a high KD, and that KD being 6.83. Um, slowing the ability of the VDR and subsequently uh, the ability of the innate immune system to produce AMP and TLR2 is such a logical survival mechanism for any form of pathogen I'll slow this down for you, that it seems almost certain that other microbes besides MTB, HIV, and some certain biofilm bacteria have also evolved ways to dysregulate the VDR or other receptors involved in the immune response. So it appears good. It appears that the microbiota responsible for autoimmune disease gradually shut down the innate immune response over the course of a person's lifetime as it incrementally accumulates bacteria and other pathogens. Eventually, genes from the accumulating microbial metagenome may trigger a clinical disease symptomology such as one of the autoimmune diagnoses or it may simply drive the inflammation associated with the aches and pains of aging. Indeed, as, uh, as the microbiota accumulates over a lifetime, there is also a direct increase in diseases and symptoms associated with inflammation. In essence, wear and tear aside, as the microbiota accumulates over a lifetime, humans go from this to this. We have been running a large observational trial for patients with autoimmune diagnoses that uses a VDR agonist uh, to reactivate the VDR nuclear receptor and very low doses of bacteriostatic antibiotics to help eliminate the microbiota. Um, and since the treatment was developed by Professor Trevor Marshall, who's right there, it is referred to as Marshall's Protocol, or the MP for short. Um, the goal of the treatment is bacterial death, but when bacteria inside the cells die, some of the cells die too, and that results uh, in a reaction called immunopathology. And uh, um, some of you might recognize acute phase immunopathology as the jarks herxheimer reaction. Um, but basically what happens is that when bacteria are killed, the innate immune system releases cytokines and endotoxins. And the subsequent apoptosis uh, leads to a rise in inflammation that we call immunopathology. And then additional symptoms also, uh, also arise as the liver and kidneys have to deal with the endotoxins. Um, and immunopathology has to be controlled so that patients can have a reasonable quality of life. So it sometimes takes seriously ill patients on the MP several years to gradually eliminate their bacterial loads. But as bacterial load drops, patients incrementally report improvement and ultimately objective markers indicating disease resolution. And while not all patients have been on the MP long enough to report symptomatic remission, nearly all patients, that was immunopathology, nearly all patients on the MP have experienced immunopathology, and essentially all of them. And the ubiquitous nature of this reaction in patients in study subjects and its absence in their healthy counterparts really serves as proof positive that the VDR agonist does indeed allow patients to target the microbiota. But what causes the antibodies? Patient A, the 58-year-old female, uh, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in 1996. Um, and she started the MP in August of 2004. And before starting the MP and during earlier periods of treatment, she presented with 17 positive ANA titers. Um, and then after starting the MP, you can see in March 2005, 
her antibody titers went up from 1 to 160 to 1 to 320. But by August of 2005, they were back down at 1 to 160. And then in November of 2006, they came back negative. And since that time, her ANA levels have been retested eight more times and have remained negative. Um, at the same time, as reported via an online progress report, patient A noted a steady decrease in her RA symptoms during the same time period that her ANA titers became, t titers became negative uh, or started to drop. Um, and today her symptoms are extremely mild in comparison to those she experienced pre-MP when her ANA titers were high. Um, patient A's test results in reaction to the MP again support the hypothesis that uh, RA and auto, other autoimmune diseases are caused by the accumulation of a pathogenic microbiota. It may be that as a patient with autoimmune disease accumulates bacteria unique to their disease state, that the innate immune system, to the extent it can, continually attempts to attack the microbes present. And this would result in the innate immune system uh, releasing cytokines and chemokines. And that, in turn, stimulates the adaptive immune system. And then what could happen is that the adaptive immune system begins generating antibodies in response to the bacterial debris being generated by phagocytosis. Um, and what this really calls for is a reevaluation of the autoantibody. Uh, just as the antibodies created in response to CMV, rickettsia, bartonella, and other pathogens serve as a way to infer the presence of infection, uh, many of what we consider to be autoantibodies in various autoimmune diagnoses may also infer the presence of infection and in pathogens, except pathogens that have yet to be fully characterized and named. Um, here's another case history. Patient B is a 49-year-old female. She was diagnosed with Hashimoto's in November of 2004. And uh, in September of 2004, um, which is her diagnosis state more specifically, uh, her antibody, uh, thyroglobulin antibodies were at 200 IU per milliliter. Um, and then after 10 months on the MP, um, when she reported strong levels of immunopathology, her ANA, uh, her thyroglobulin antibodies, I'm sorry, rose to 217 IU per milliliter. But then after one year and 11 months on the therapy, her immunopathology slowed greatly. And uh, in, that indicated that her bacterial load had dropped. And at the same time, when her antibodies were tested, they had indeed decreased and were only at 51 IU per milliliter. And as with patient A, patient B um, also um, has experienced a disease resolution um, where she once had high levels, um, or one, where what she once had to take supplemental thyroid medication, uh, she no longer has to, and she's back to uh, pretty good condition. Um, and here's patient C, a 55-year-old female, again with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, in November of 2004, before starting the MP, uh, her peroxidase antibody count was above 1,000. And then she began the MP in February of 2006. And shortly after starting the treatment, she reported very high levels of immunopathology. And her antibody, uh, peroxidase antibody count shot up to 2,000 Im immediately. And then um, after several years now, though, of reducing her bacterial load with the MP, um, as of January 2009, her antibody count is at just 232. And she's doing much better. Um, she also, her thyroid levels were once high and now they've returned to the normal range and uh, her symptom improvement is, is great. Um, so note that the antibody titers of both patients A, B, and C actually went up from their baseline level during early or periods of the treatment. Well, this corresponds to times when there were high levels of immunopathology likely because the immune system um, was dealing with high levels of bacterial debris generated by phagocytosis. So we see that, we see that pattern uh, going up and down. And uh, this rise in antibody production in response to increased bacterial death further supports our model, which is a model which shows how antibodies currently perceived as autoantibodies are actually created in response to dying bacteria. 
Well, a shift in the way we understand the production of antibodies in autoimmune disease would, of course, change the way autoimmune diseases are treated. Um, if we accept that the antibodies observed in autoimmune diseases are created in response to bacteria, then uh, using corticosteroid medications to suppress the innate immune response is completely counterproductive and is likely to, is going to allow pathogens to spread um, in the long term. Um, and in fact, Gottlieb et al., uh, their study here, found that 74% of sarcoidosis patients who were administered just 20 milligrams of prednisone a day relapsed after just one year, which was a significantly higher portion of time than people who were not administered prednisone. And they concluded that corticosteroids contribute to the prolongation of disease by delaying resolution. And they found uh, no data to support the contention that corticosteroids alter long-term disease progression. Instead, if the antibodies in autoimmune disease are created largely in response to bacteria, then patients should be put on therapies that enhance immune function. And uh, last year's International Congress on Autoimmunity, uh, Captain Tom Perez, who has since retired after 25 years with the FDA, reported uh, partial results of our study, which showed that among patients who had been on the MP for less than 18 months, 49% reported symptom level improvement all of the time, even during peak levels of immunopathology. And then 81% of patients reported uh, uh, disease resolution or high level symptom improvement um, or significant improvement after spending between 18 to 53 months on the treatment. And this chart um, over here discusses the great data in greater detail, and I'd be happy to talk about that with you later. <laughs> complicated. Um, Robert Koch theorized that one pathogen causes one disease. Instead, our data indicates that many pathogens contribute to chronic disease and that chronic disease results as people gradually accumulate many different bacteria. And this explains the overlap often observed between so many of the autoimmune diagnoses to the point where sometimes people will get diagnosed with a different disease depending on the diagnosis methodology. Um, this wheel shows how truly related chronic diseases really are. Each spoke on the wheel represents a study which showed a significant statistical relationship between patients suffering from one disease and the next. And our own data confirms this overlap. Each spoke on this wheel shows a significant uh, a comorbidity among a random sample of 50 patients in our trial. And that's some serious overlap. Um, so this may also explain why we see so much overlap between antibody production in patients with different uh, autoimmune, and antibody production in patients with different autoimmune diagnoses, and why such antibodies are often very polyspecific. Like the bacteria that cause autoimmune disease, clearly there is no simple one antibody, one disease model either. Well, the key haunt point to take home from my presentation is to understand that the microbiota can persist by suppressing the innate immune system. My colleagues and I have found that standard blood work can be readily assessed for the VDR dysregulation characteristic of this innate immune dysfunction. And it is this innate immune dysregulation that allows opportunistic pathogens such as EBV, Borrelia, HHV, Chlamydia, MTB, and others to proliferate. So, in addition to looking for antibodies to these acute opportunistic infections, it's also very important that we look for antibodies indicating underlying chronic pathogens, the antibodies we may now be mistaking for autoantibodies. Thank you. Thank you for addressing Toad. I feel a bit less human. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so, any, any questions for him? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, first, I will start with that, that uh, uh, everyone has uh, natural autoantibodies, which can recognize some autoantigens and also some pathogens. But existing of the natural autoantibodies uh, never get uh, some autoimmune disease. My question is, uh, we are living together with bacteria always, generation after generation. How you can explain this increased number of the autoimmune patients of the last years? 
There's quite a few things that I uh, think can happen in the 20th century that have uh, allowed uh, people's bacterial loads to increase, people to acquire bacteria earlier in life, and to allow the microbiota, the pathogenic aspects of the microbiota, pro to proliferate much more easily. Well, one is the use, as I alluded to in my talk, one is the use of so many immunosuppressive medications. Uh, corticosteroids are, uh, at least in the United States, doled out very easily. And if this is, is the case, that there are pathogens in the disease process, this use of corticosteroids is, is going to temporarily uh, palliate the patient while allowing the disease process to really, really get worse in the long term. And, and also, uh, even drugs like TNF-alpha inhibitors, uh, which, which stop the production of certain cytokine, are really doing something very similar because if, there's, if you stop an important cytokine from being able to target the microbiota, um, again, you might see, uh, you might, the, symptom, the patient might feel less symptomatic because there's less of a battle between pathogen and man, but you are not necessarily improving the actual root cause of the disease. And so that's one reason, is that um, modern medicine is maybe not, it's very good at palliation, but it's not necessarily doing a very good job right now at targeting the root cause of these diseases. And also, um, if you look at some of our other research, um, we have found that um, the VDR nuclear receptor, as I mentioned, is very important in controlling the innate immune response. Well, our molecular and silico data um, shows there's two main forms of vitamin D, um, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D form, and then there's 125-hydroxy vitamin D. Well, neither, neither form is a vitamin. Um, they're both secosteroids, and 125D is a secosteroid and also a hormone and can also serve as a cytokine. So the simple uh, vitamin D pragma of uh, vitamin in benefit out model no longer, uh, no longer makes any sense with what molecular biologists are finding regarding vitamin D. And what our data has shown is that 125D, as expected, does activate the VDR. So, but the 25-hydroxy form which is uh, the form that's found in food and supplements actually inactivates the VDR. And I know this is definitely uh, new to some people in terms of their thinking, but what we see is that what happens is that like other drugs that suppress the innate immune response, vitamin D in that form is itself a corticosteroid that also slows the immune response. And so you see patients reacting a little bit like if they're on prednisone. And so, um, we actually don't, uh, patients on the MP uh, actually re decrease their vitamin D intake, which of course is very different in, than what a lot of other studies are doing, but our results um, show that it in, does indeed work. But So fortification, and it's not so bad in Europe, but fortification of the food chain in the United States, particularly with vitamin D, where it's now in cereals and milk and crackers, and I don't, it, it's, it's, it's very a dangerous way to uh, tamper what, with the amount of vitamin D that nature intended to have to regulate such an such a important receptor. And that's another possible option. And um, there's also um, sort of a, uh, a sun-loving culture. Um, more people who are more willing to get super tan right now, and I won't go into the details of that, but that can also skew the v ability of the VDR to work correctly, um, which, uh, which is another reason. And so there's, um, those are some of the top reasons. I, I could talk forever, but I won't do that to you guys. <laughs> there's a question in the back there, yes? OK, very good talk. So. Thank you. We have uh, several examples for this disease. Do we have any success with examples for lupus? Lupus, we definitely have study subjects with lupus. Um, I, we do have a few patients who have recovered from lupus. Do you have in this fact, slide? Uh, I don't have a lupus slide. Yeah. No, the, the least slide has lupus on it. Oh, the, yeah, the recovery slide. Um, let's see. Can we find lupus? Lupus. Um, SLA. SLA, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, just after the baby. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. SLA, yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah. we had, um, uh, oh, what am I um, improved beyond the second year. We had two patients who reported improvement beyond the second year. We had uh, another two patients who were improved in the first year, and we had 
another three patients who were improved, no, yeah, we had uh, and another three patients who improved in the first year. So we do have people, and I, I actually just, uh, I have a blog, um, a science blog related to this where I interview patients, and I just recently interviewed a lupus, re recovered lupus patient as well, so that's just in my mind. But yes? Uh, just full on this, the M marches the shoulder cones to a cocktail of something and the bodies? No, the main thing is the VDR agonist. Well, that's the most important part, but patients do take uh, pulse, low-dose antibiotics, which is more important at the beginning of the treatment because that's when you really need to help the immune system along by the antibiotics block various bacterial ribosomes, and in doing that, they, they decrease the ability of the bacteria to you know, make proteins necessary for survival. But it's really key that they're pulse, low doses. High doses of antibiotics have immunosuppressive properties, and you, if you do high-dose antibiotics, they don't work. And there's a lot of research showing that biofilm bacteria are, are best targeted by low pulse foot antibiotics, and that's really where we started to, we, we decided to use that, and it's worked beautifully. Um, the amount of immunopathology that our patients experience is, is high, very high. Yes? Okay. Sorry. Is that but, you uh, yeah, very uh, similar. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so in your some of the data you show you you examine the anti auto antibody against specific uh, uh, well antigens, let's say proxy mm -hmm. or something. Uh, in particular patients, are they all the same or uh, they how do you you know correlate that? Um well what I was trying to say was that um, I'm not really sure from based on our study and our molecular work that autoantibodies even exist. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the antibodies that we now perceive as an autoantibodies may actually just be regular antibodies, regular antibodies which are created in response to bacteria. You know, we all know that some antibodies are like if you really want to detect Borrelia for a patient with Lyme you look for the antibody. Well I was the reason I was talking about the prolific uh, nature of the human microbiota at the beginning of the talk and the fact that so much of the microbiota has yet to be named and characterized is because there really could be, uh, there could be uh, antibodies to pathogens that we don't yet know uh, about yet. Yeah. And, and those could be what we think are autoantibodies. Now, um, there's many, many of those pathogens. So right now, um, I think the level of complexity is going to be really high and we might just, um, at some point, I think that with the, with the wheels, when I was trying to show you how interrelated everything was, I was trying to show you that there might be, there's a lot of complexity in trying to assign a specific antibody to a certain bacteria, and we may need to drop back and just uh, embrace more of an overlap between the autoimmune diagnoses and the antibodies that we see with them. You know, there might not be such a need to be so carefully looking for specific things, and the, the goal would be just to target the underlying infection. Yeah, that's right. I guess to my second question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe quickly so that we can have two more questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, the second question is uh, the treating, I'm not familiar with the MP treatment. Right. Treatment. So uh, a low dose antibiotics, mm -hmm. so they are pan antibiotics, or I assume, or are they uh, against the particular type? Because uh, sometimes uh, the biota, you can theoretically say why people will eat mm -hmm. some kind of yogurt or something. So oh, you're not both yeah. another type or whether it's pan uh, suppression is uh, always good. Uh, suppression is good? Whether pan suppression, as you said, um, during, during the martial treatment. Right, no, we um, actually, the antibiotics are chosen, they're just simple bacteriostatic antibiotics, Zithromax, Clindamycin, minocycline. They're chosen because all bacteria have certain uh, ribosome subunits. Uh, all bacteria detected as of yet share certain common characteristics, certain bacterial subunits. So minocycline will bind and block 30S ribosomal subunit. And then clindamycin will come in and block a different region, I believe, of the 30S ribosome subunit, the 70S ribosome. Um, and so as you increase, uh, the goal of the treatment is to get patients on a three antibiotic combination where um, where three ri different ribosomes are being blocked in three different ways. And, and that, uh, when that's happening and each bacteria, uh, most bacteria have all those ribosomes, 
it's almost impossible, as from what we know yet, due to bacteria, that if that, there's a bacteria that has evolved three mutations that it would allow uh, that would allow it to evade um, being targeted by the three different antibiotics. So that's kind of the way we we work things, and it seems to uh, to work. Yes. Maybe you're not done. Well, sorry. Um, thank you for your talk. Microbes have long been suspected as a cause of autoimmune disease. But from this point, to suggest that uh, immunization is the deterioration for autoimmune diseases, it's a big jump. It? it is a big time. Um, but I think that we have to realize right now that um, with all the drugs that we have, with all the drugs we're creating, uh, the pro every autoimmune disease is on the rise. Uh, the prevalence of every single autoimmune disease is on the rise. And something's wrong. We've been working on this for a long time. We've been working on these diseases. We've been using corticosteroids in the United States. TNF alpha drugs are being used politically. And yet, our patients are really getting sicker. Um, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, so it's, it's, it's something to think about. If you have, let's say, a patient with sarcoidosis and, and mm -hmm. uh, eye problems, what will you do? Oh, don't that's... Give steroids? Don't give steroids. Well, what I would do is put them onto this, our treatment, the Marshall yeah. Protocol. Um, and, because... And when we have many in the cohort... The we... Well, sarcoidosis is actually... Well, the, the first disease um, that patients tried this treatment for was sarcoidosis, and we had actually the most uh, patients recovered with sarcoidosis. The treatment the top of Yeah. So without... Yeah, yeah UBI is, we see a lot of people... Um, and it's actually when patients have uh, comorbid conditions, um, they all react to the same uh, to the same therapy. So if you if you had it depends what your symptoms were before starting the treatment. If you had lung involvement, eye involvement, kidney involvement, and arthritis in your leg, you would experience immunopathology in those same areas. And so actually, it's if you if you want, you can't put a patient on the treatment just to target their sarcoidosis. Their uveitis will respond as well. That's what we found. Maybe From, the clinic. No, sorry. Okay. From the clinic again, we have sepsis and we give steroids and sepsis. That's terrible. Good. <laughs> it is, it's bad. It's, in my opinion, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a young child and it's adaptive immune system is not even up and running yet. What status of this improves survival? Sure. Well, Short-term short survival, I would say, but I think that suppressing the innate immune response of a, pa of a baby, especially when the adaptive immune system isn't even yet running until a two and a half or so months into their lifetimes, suppressing the innate immune response puts that baby at, at able, it makes the baby able to acquire a whole number of pathogens early in life, and then those bacteria can uh, turn into chronic forms, they can easily form into biofilm communities, and then you're, I think you're putting that child at a great disadvantage, unfortunately. What about viral? Sorry? Viral. 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 Uh, well, yeah. what, what I was saying is that... Um, bacteria, and you, you listed a lot of diseases in the background or other languages, jobs, virus. You're right. Um, but I did, I did, I alluded to it in my talk. Um, what happens is that we think that the bacteria are the pathogens that are causing the underlying immune dysregulation, the, the, the uh, causing the innate immune response to be slowed gradually over time because of their ability to block the receptor, the VDR and other receptors in the, involved in the immune response. But when that happens, when the innate immune response is slowed, then the patient can pick up viruses, they can pick up primes if necessary, they can pick up any other pathogens. And that becomes what we what we call talk, tell our patients colloquially we call it their pea soup, sort of their collective mix of pathogens that they accumulate as over a lifetime. And then those pathogens do have an effect on the disease process. But what I what I'm saying is that if you only target the virus, if you strive to only target the virus and you don't target the underlying chronic pathogens that are causing the immune system to be slowed in the first place. The patient will really never recover. Well, no. From our research, shows the opposite. That the bacteria, the underlying yeah, cause. I think maybe you can discuss this after. Yeah. Just a final question sure. there, and then I think we'll have to stop there. Sure. Time. Yeah. Yes.
Amy, I really enjoy your talk. Thank you. It's beyond my expectation, actually. Oh, so you. yeah, your observation very fit to one of the diseases what I'm working on is mm -hmm. autoimmune strong side opinion. The patient mm -hmm. develop antibody, type of their own antibody. Mm -hmm. So then in the last several years, the people found the bacteria in our stomach, we call it the H. pylori. Yeah. It's correlated with this disease process. Interesting. Use antibiotics to remove H. pylori from the stomach, that's ITP, you need strong cytopenia to recover. Really? So that's very fit to that's, what you observation. That's fit to our, our model. Where yes, your model is working very well in the sun, but I'll, I also share some concept with our co-chill, maybe not completely, mm -hmm. but I can t t feel some of uh, the concept that is in the Western countries. So seems to me the autoimmune disease that's prevalence is instance increase. Yeah, and I hard to me to imagine that. Now, today we face to the bacteria or parasite and uh, as much as what in the 50 years or 100 years ago, when you work in the jungle, I'm assuming mm -hmm. that we've got more chance to face to bacteria. So that is my concept as what we discussed before. And also, um, yeah. the issue is just we develop our immune raptors, the B cell and the T cell raptors, is against the bacteria or virus in the long term of our evolution. Right. But today, in a Western country, we live in a more relatively more clean environment. So our, we built a lot of military, what I mean, B cell and T cell, to target this invasive microorganism. But now, that is opposite as what you concept this. We have less microorganism infection than this. So all our military events cannot to shoot any of these potential enemies, so then we have to shoot ourselves. <laughs> that is my original concept. Yeah, I suppose so. Concept um, to build all the I mean, let me comment on that. Um, yeah, I don't think I, I don't uh, I don't think that with so many microbes in our own bodies and so many there's bacteria everywhere. If you look at uh, recent studies on biofilm bacteria, they've been found in glaciers, they've been found in the depths of caves, they've been found they're everywhere. Whether you pick them up or not really depends on the strength of your immune system. Um, and it, the idea that people in the West are no longer coming in contact with any bacteria is just it's not, it doesn't make sense. There's plenty of bacteria there. There's really plenty of it. So I think it's really the other way around is that those people who have less bacteria and who have stronger immune systems to keep, uh, to fight pathogens as they, as they uh, come in contact with them are the ones who are going to remain healthier. Uh, not nice well, well, maybe you don't want to discuss after I say, you know, we, we'll really pass uh, and we'll have another session this afternoon. <laughs> so I really would like to, to thank all the speakers and uh, obviously yourself for the contribution and especially the last discussion as well. It's quite lively. So thanks again to all the speakers. And